indeed cooperation. But in the usual, when you talk about multi-stakeholders, usually you have so three governments, business and civil society. But that's not enough today. When 50% uh, of the world population is below, 50% uh, is below 27 years old, you have to integrate the young generation into those processes of taking decisions which determine our lives in 10, 15, 20 years from now on. So you have to reach out. Uh, we have, as you know, uh, Matthew, we have integrated young global leaders, we have integrated global shapers, uh, but it's always limited. So you have to really go out and to make sure that everybody becomes a global shaper, and that you can only do via social media. So just tell us a bit about, what do you mean by a global shaper? A global shaper is what, someone in their 20s? or uh, Global shapers for us is a community which we have built um, in the age between 20 and 30 and we have today, we have uh, a hub of global shapers in 180 uh, cities around the world. And what is common in those young people is that they all are committed to work together, but they also have another commonality, which means not only to represent themselves, but to reach out via Twitter, via Facebook and so on, to create an engagement, a movement, because um, when we look at our future, I think it's all our future, and particularly young people's future. So they have to get engaged, and I hope that um, despite all the challenges which we see, we get a real global movement of engagement related to environmental challenges, related to uh, certain uh, terrorist challenges, and so on and so on. I mean, after the financial crisis in September 2008 and so forth, I remember being in, in Davos at the World Economic Forum and you were very much talking about the need for a reboot a complete rethink of how yeah. the world operates. Now, how is that, from your perspective, uh, has that gone well? Has it, are, are we, I mean, from, for many of us, it doesn't seem to have gone all that well, but I mean, what's, your, what's your sense of that? You see, we are at the moment in a situation where, when you have a crisis, everybody becomes more egoistic. And we see it in the behavior of countries, um, mainly pursuing a maximization of national uh, interests and not necessarily always uh, working in the interest of global citizenship. Now what I said in 2007, 2008 when the crisis started, I said we are in a financial crisis and this financial crisis will lead into an economic crisis, which happened. But then I said it will lead into a social crisis and look at, uh, for example, um, youth unemployment in, in Spain, um, nearly 50%. Uh, but the social crisis at the end may lead into a generational crisis because in order to address all those issues, we have a tendency with stats uh, to, to um, load the burden on the next generation. And one day, I, I'm afraid, the young generation has two opportunities, uh, two alternatives, either to take over and to make sure that their interests are uh, safeguarded or to revolt in a more uh, negative way. And do you feel we're getting close to that point where, I mean, I guess the Occupy movement flourished over the past year, but then seems to have run out of steam a bit. Do you see something new in the works that may it, be more revolutionary? It depends very much uh, how much we get the economy under control and we address particularly the issue of uh, unemployment. I think this is a key issue, job creation in the world. If we think that in the world in the next 10 years, 400 million new jobs have to be created. Now with uh, the technological revolution which we also uh, witness, um, how we will get those 400 million uh, jobs, I think is still a big question mark. And this will decide whether we have a revolution of the next generation or not. What do you think are the most promising areas for job creation? I think social entrepreneurship. I'm, uh, uh, as you know, Matthew, I created 10 years ago a, a special foundation 
uh, to promote social entrepreneurship. I feel we will go into a, a global situation where jobs are not anymore offered to a large part. You have to create your own job. And creating your own job, not necessarily in order to make money, but to address a social issue. I, I'm, very, uh, I'm very encouraged by the fact when I look around uh, those global shapers, today you find so many people who call themselves social entrepreneurs. Not necessarily um, engaged in not for profit making, but looking at the profit not as the main objective, but looking at social innovation, social service, the goods. Uh, as the key purpose of what they are doing. Now, as you, you know, look at this younger generation of leadership and you see your own or generation or the generation that are now in power, do you feel there are different values, different um, techniques, different aspirations of this younger generation compared to, to the older people? Yes, uh, the younger generation is much more global. Um, if, if you take uh, Facebook or the social media, uh, you are not, uh, let's say, restricted by national borders. You, you are really part of a global community. And I think this is also expressed in the mindset of this young generation. So uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic that in the future, when we address global issues, we have a much greater constituency because those people have grown up with a global identity and um, that's exactly what we need. We cannot address global issues anymore on the basis of national identities. We have to do it as global citizens. I mean, I, I agree with that as an aspiration, but I mean, it does seem to me that at this moment, moment in history that there's less idealism about national, about sort of multinational organizations like the United Nations? In the older generation, I, I would, I'm very encouraged if I see uh, young people in the 20s uh, who, who are really engaged in social media, they first are thinking global, they want to act global, and they have, I think, a great idealism because they know it's only through idealism that you can make this world a better world. Now, do you um, think that those leaders who are, you know, maybe not the best leaders in the world today, and to, do they understand um, the extent to which social media now can, can actually uh, lead to them being removed from office? And what are you seeing in terms of their reaction to that? And, and how do we make sure they don't win? Let's not forget, uh, social media are a relatively new phenomenon, so um, uh, older people, including myself, have to learn first. Uh, but um, I think the, the mistake some older people are making is to look at social media as a means towards a certain purpose. And uh, social media is much more. It's a way of life. It's a way of communication. It changes. The difference is, when we had, until now, technological innovations, they changed how we were doing things. But social media are changing ourselves because they are changing our behavior, our pattern. And uh, that's probably difficult for uh, older people to understand. You really have to engage yourself, you have to indulge into social media to know what it means. Uh, it's a fantastic way of life, it's more than an instrument. And particularly it's more than a public relations instrument. So you think people are actually going to be, I mean, their, their, their underlying behaviors and the way they relate to the world is being changed by this m movement, by this technology? Yes, if it will take time. I mean, uh, just imagine uh, the next 20 years, um, most of the leaders uh, who will come into power in the next 20 years have grown up, say, are millennials. So um, we will have a completely different way of how we look at our global um, challenges at our global environment and framework. Now I wonder, I mean, in closing, whether I could ask what advice you would have 
to younger people um, about how they, sh they should go about setting up organizations and so forth? Because you, as a young man, started the World Economic Forum. And I guess if you were starting it today, you'd probably start a web put a website out, um, put a hashtag up, um, mm -hmm. and so forth, rather than invite people to the mountains and have a conversation. So what advice would you give to young leaders today as they, tr as they have a big idea and, and, and want to set out and put it into action? I would say uh, what is very important is that when you think about young people, say, think globally, uh, to understand other cultures. Uh, we have to create, a, and we, not to create, we are living in a multicultural world. And to understand other cultures despite social media, uh, we should not assume that social media create one global culture. Uh, I think the, the world of tomorrow will be characterized by social media, but it still will remain very much a multicultural world where we have a global identity, but we, we have to respect different cultures. So understanding different cultures, and particularly cultures which are not necessarily Western cultures, is very important. But, uh, and, and in terms of the actual uh, process of, of, of being a leader in that world. I mean, it's an ability to engage across these different cultures, or? Yes, uh, but um, uh, when, you, when you look, uh, what, what, what creates a leader? In, in my opinion, um, a leader has brains, heart, um, which means brains, he must be a good professional, heart, he must have passion but he has to have also a soul. And the soul is the vision, the values. And we have to go into the direction of creating global values. And with the help of social media, I think we can achieve this objective better compared to not having social media at our disposal. Well, thank you, Klaus. And just in, in wrapping up, if someone wants to, if some, anyone around the world in the 100 countries involved in the Social Good Summit want to uh, connect with the World Economic Forum or you know, influence it in any way, how do they do that? Uh, go to our website, which is um, webforum, uh, veforum.org. Uh, and, um, but, don't uh, be just a passive um, uh, consumer of what we are doing. I invite you to, to contribute with ideas as much as possible. So, Klaus Schwab, thank you very much for S thank sharing you your vision much, with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be back a bit later with another interview with Jane Goodall. Thank you. That's great. Apple juice kid. Love it. All right. Just want to remind everyone that uh, uh, we're pretty much going uh, around the clock this evening with Social Good Summit, running into the global conversation segment. Remember, it will be on the live stream at mashable.com slash SGS at 2 a.m. from Beijing, 6 a.m. from Mogadishu, and at 9 a.m. from Nairobi. And also a reminder that, that uh, the doors will open here 
at the 92nd Street Y at 9 a.m. for that Nairobi segment for those of you who are coming and joining us at the Digital Media Lounge and, and want to participate and be here for that. So just remember that. Social Good Summit goes around the clock. Um, our, our next segment is going to look a little bit democracy and social. We'd like to welcome to, to the stage Marina Kelihurand, the Estonian Ambassador to the United States. Javier Marin, managing partner of Dialcom Spontanea, Spontania, I'm sorry. Peter Mihalko, the Slovak political director. Maria Leisner, the secretary general of the Community of, the Democ Community of Democracies. In a conversation moderated by Dr. Tamika Tilleman, senior advisor for civil society and emerging democracies. Today, they're going to be discussing democracy and social in the 21st century. Please, please welcome our conversationalists. All right. Relax for a bit now. Well, good evening. My name is Tamika Tilleman. As you just heard, I work for somebody who you may have heard of named Hillary Clinton. And when she spoke to this audience <laughs> yesterday, she mentioned an initiative that we are engaged in to build a new social network for leaders in emerging democracies. And we have a staggering array, array of intellectual firepower with us tonight to talk about that project. These are the people that are making it happen. Before we get to them, in just a moment, we want to give you a little bit of background on this initiative, why we think it's important, why we think it's it's exciting. If we look at the world over the last few years, we see that social media and democracy have had a pretty good run together. Let's take a look at Egypt, for example, where last year you saw social media mobilize the movement that toppled one of the world's longest standing authoritarian governments. A few months earlier, you saw similar events unfold in Tunisia. If you go back to 2009, we saw the Twitter revolution in Moldova. We could tell a number of other stories, all of which provide, at this point, pretty iron clad evidence that social media can help people take down bad governments. What we don't know yet and what we absolutely need to find out is whether social media can help replace those regimes with better governments. And that's the tool that that's the question that we've been focusing on recently. Can social media help us move from mobilization to democratization? And when we talk about democratization, we don't just mean voting. We mean governments that provide education, accountable institutions, the rule of law, the other things that citizens need to thrive. So as we started working on that question, and my team at the State Department, I, I work a little bit like a venture capitalist on these issues. We try to find the best ideas that we can to help strengthen emerging democracies. And we realized very quickly as we began this pro process that this was not something we could do on our own. We needed help. Because as a country, the United States has been through democratization, but we went through that process 200 years ago. There's nobody alive who remembers it, and frankly, it took place in a very different era. We are fortunate, though, that over the last 20 years or so, since 1989, there have been more than 40 transitions to democracy. And as a result, the world has created a new reservoir of expertise on democratization. And we recognize that if we could help leaders in new democracies tap into that reservoir of expertise, we could give them the information that they need to make better decisions. The product of this realization is something we call the LEN Network, which stands for Leaders Engaged in New Democracies. And this is uh, an initiative that is possible through an extraordinary partnership between the organizations and companies that you see listed here, all working under the auspices of the Community of Democracies, whose Secretary General is with us. And together we put together something that looks a lot like a traditional social network that is organized around communities with topics like the rule of law and human rights. Uh, and it brings together some of the finest leaders in the world. Let's go inside one of these communities. Individuals who have helped guide past transitions to democracy and success successful past transitions to democracy and who are now willing to share the knowledge that they've acquired about what to do and, as importantly, what not to do. You can browse profiles just like you would on any social network and when you find someone you want to connect to, you can launch a live video chat from within the network. 
We did this recently, and if you want to know how this works in practice, we did this recently with the Deputy Prime Minister of Moldova, the former Foreign Minister of Slovakia, and a number of others connected from Mongolia. It worked great. It was very exciting, although a very high stakes move for my career, I have to admit. Um, and then we also have incorporated some groundbreaking trans translation capability that effectively eliminates linguistic barriers when we're engaged in text communication. The goal of all of this is to create a world in which the task of fostering progress in new democracies is no longer the responsibility of individual countries, but rather a collective undertaking for an entire community of democracies. And that's what we're shooting for. We have with us the individuals who have built this platform and made it happen from Slovakia, Peter Michalko, who is the political director of that country's foreign ministry, the ambassador of Estonia, Maria, Marina Kaljurand, whose uh, name I've been practicing the pronunciation of, the secretary general of the Community of Democracies, Ambassador Maria Leisner, and then from Dialcom Spontania, we have Javier Marin. And Peter, let me start with you. Your country went through transition 20 years ago, but you're now in NATO, you're in the European Union, and yet I'm as likely to bump into you, I know from experience, in Tunisia or Moldova as I am in Brussels or Washington or New York. Why is your country committed to this work? Why are you working so hard to strengthen new democracies? Well, thank you, Jamaica. Uh, we, uh, of course, uh, realize that uh, when we uh, contribute uh, and uh, to uh, helping these countries, these nations, uh, to become more prosperous, to strengthen their democracies and changes. Uh, we strengthen also uh, globally security and we can have shared prosperity and stability. Uh, that is the main reason. We can bring uh, this way stability to all regions. And we also feel that it is important that we share the experience that we have accumulated during our successful transition with others. Because this way, as we were helped at, uh, at uh, that time uh, by our friends, uh, now we can also do our part and we can help these uh, countries to avoid problems that inevitably appear uh, during very difficult transition, economic, political, building democratic rules for the society. We can provide necessary information to those uh, who need it, and we can assist them to shorten this, uh, this road uh, towards a democratic and prosperous society. Uh, so we have been engaged in these uh, activities in uh, southeastern Europe, in eastern Europe, in the region of Middle East and uh, northern Africa more recently. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, were active uh, by our government uh, supported uh, activities, but also through our civil society. Our civil society was very strengthened throughout our transition and played leading role in many fields. Now it is also leading in sharing this experience with others. And here, uh, initiatives like LAND are very important because they are enhancing and multiplying effectivity of our action. Because actually, this way, we can, we can use it in more effective way as source of information for those who need it and also the way how to transmit, how to, how to make this information available uh, to those who are engaged in, tran in transition in respective countries. That's so the software for successful transition is uh, helped by technology. That's a new Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Marina, let me ask you, uh, Estonia, I was sitting next to your foreign minister at a meeting recently, and he referred to your country as Estonia. And there are very few nations in the world that have done more to hardwire, literally and figuratively, technology into their governance and their democracy. How is this working out for Estonia? What benefits are you seeing from this work? And what do you think other countries stand to learn from it? Yes, first of all, I'd like to say that we're very happy to co-chair LEND Absolutely. together with the United States. And as to Estonia, yes, the question that the eternal question of Homlet, to be or not to be, was answered 20 years ago in Estonia, definitely to E. <laughs> because 
because for us it was a tool in our way from communism to being a free democratic country. Uh, Estonia today is e-dependent. <laughs> we have e-government, electronic elections, e-school, all together about 300 services which are provided to people via internet. And when I say electronic, then I don't mean electronic uh, devices in the booths, but I mean electronic voting via internet. And the stereotype that electronic solutions are only for young people, that's wrong. My mother is 85, she's Skyping. Skype was invented in Estonia. She's filling in her taxation forms, she's doing bank transactions and so on. Children have the first school book, electronic school book this year, and I can continue. We are very active in internet consuming, but what we want to do today is to be advocates and promoters of internet freedom. Last year in Freedom House, Freedom on Internet report, Estonia ranked first in the world. Second was US, third was Germany. Tomorrow, Freedom House will publish its next report. We hope that we'll be able to remain our position there, and we hope that there will be more countries who will be ranked free. But there we need assistance. We need help from like-minded countries. We need help from like-minded organizations. We need help from like-minded non-state actors, a lot of whom are today in this audience, so that the internet freedom will be a human right as well as other universal rights, and Absolutely. everybody will have the right for in internet. Well, I think we all have a lot to learn from uh, Estonia's use of technology. Uh, Maria, let me ask you, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Maria, let me ask you, the Community of Democracies is an organization that brings together democratic governments, civil society, and private sector organizations to support and advance democracy around the world. Through the community, we are able to do extraordinary projects like this that have this uh, phenomenal array of partners. But frankly, it's really hard work to bring all of these different actors together. Is it worth it? And, and what are the benefits of this type of multilateral cooperation in your view? Well, uh, it, is, it, it gives a lot of energy, I can promise you, to bring together all these fabulous actors from all over the world who are so different and so, uh, who draw their experiences from so many different countries and models. I would like to say that uh, democracy is multitude. Uh, there is not one single model of democracy. Uh, we uh, have I think as many systems as there are countries in the world, perhaps even more because some countries have federalism with their own systems. But what we do have uh, is um, a common norm, values. We share our democratic values. And the community of democracies is about bringing together people who share these values, but who are pooling their experiences from all of these different transitions and different setups and different cultures, because the problems that political practitioners and other democracy actors encounter in all the world are actually the same. There are different ways of attacking them. But when someone like Peter from Slovakia goes to Tunisia, as I know that you've done, and sit down and talk to the government there, you can say that, well, you know, we encountered exactly these problems 20 years ago, Absolutely. and this is what we did. We learn a lot. We learn a lot. Let me ask you, Javier, in the, the few moments we have left before we turn into pumpkins, you've deployed tools like this all over the world through your company, Dialcom Spontanea. What are the lessons you would suggest to those who want to make these tools work on behalf of the common good? Well, without a doubt, um, there are the solution for ICT for development that we have deployed in, in, in many different fields and sectors, and e health, education, government, and all that. But it will, what it always makes the difference, and why we are so passionate about this initiative, is the, the users. I mean, the users at that level, they have embraced the technology. They have said, okay, look for the best technologies that you can find and uh, how can we do our job in a better way? And they have come up with a, with a knowledge transfer platform that will create an enormous amount of information that is accessible also for other stakeholders and for other actors that will need this information. And uh, 
when you get the top leaders of the world uh, embracing the technology and say, okay, let's do our job better with this technology. I think it's also a great example for the other communities, organizations, countries, and these two things is what makes a, a, a huge difference. The users and also the topic is about democracy. If with well, this we technology we speed up 1%, 2%, you know, the process of democratization, we are benefiting a lot of people. Absolutely. So this is the difference. And well, that is certainly our hope. I want to thank each of you for being with us this evening and uh, certainly thank all of the sponsors of tonight's event. And we look forward to working with both of you, all those of you who are here uh, and all those of you who are around the world uh, to advance this goal and this project in the future. Thank you. Thank you. so much. Thank you, Apple Juice Kid. That was awesome. So a big shout out to Austin, Texas. They're having their meetup tomorrow, but I know they're watching tonight. So hi, everyone in Austin. And it's my great pleasure now to introduce Chris Locke, uh, the Managing Director of GSMA Mobile for Development Program. Here's Chris.
thank you very much, and thank you everyone here at the summit, um, as well as those of you that are watching the live stream around the world. I hope some people are watching in London, even though it's 2 a.m. Even if it's only my kids, who should be in bed now, go to sleep. Um, <laughs> So I'm from the GSMA Development Fund. Um, we have a mobile for development program. A lot of you won't know who that is. The GSMA Association is the global trade body for the mobile industry. And within the uh, mobile for development program, for the last eight years now, we've been running a lot of programs looking at how mobile has a social and economic impact, anything from mobile money through to health, et cetera. But what we're very specifically here to talk about is a program we've had running for a while now called the M Women Program, which is really looking at how we make mobile operators work with and understand the needs of women so that we can build mobile services that have a life-changing impact in countries in emerging markets. Um, and we're very lucky and very thankful to have representatives of the QTEL group here, not only Dr. Nasser, who will be on the panel in a second, but also in the audience, um, we have His Excellency Sheikh Abdullah Al Thani, the chairman of the board of the QTEL group, who have been a huge backer of the work that we've been doing and have actually had some phenomenal results that we'll hear about from their program. And also, I'd like to thank the Digital Design Agency Agency Huge, who we'll see in a moment, who have pulled together a program to help us deliver change in the services and applications that women use on mobile phones to help them improve their lives, improve their access to financial services and other things that can make them much more involved in society and more involved economically. What we try and do within the program is build these life-enhancing services and really put them in the hands of women, sometimes giving them a voice for the very first time. But we're here to launch the GSMA and Women Design Challenge, along with our other partners, USAID and Australia Aid, um, that's really trying to get the power of innovative thinking from developers around the world to try and build these services and to understand the needs in local countries and deliver these pieces there. So we're making a call to action. We're releasing a competition to try and get services built for women that really do look at what those needs are and how we deliver to them. So first of all, we need to understand the concept of what we're talking about, what those needs are, and the kind of things we've seen in our research that women use mobile for, and the way that they can have that level of impact. So I believe we have a video that we can look at that explains that. So looking at how we build services doesn't mean designing phones in a way that makes them attractive to women from purely visual and aesthetic purposes. It means really understanding what their needs are and how they can have those needs met. As an example from our research, um, the simple act of giving women access to mobile money so they can manage their own finances is life-changing. In one of our research groups, we, we had a woman recount to us the story where when she managed to get hold of her money, her husband would often beat it out of her. And she said her, you know, her husband can smash her phone up but she can't access the money. He can't access the money. So giving someone control, giving someone the ability to have the security around the way they want to live their lives, has an absolutely colossal impact on women. So to build on this and to start talking about the program, I'd like to introduce Mikel Pastanak and Marcelo Eduardo of Huge to put more con context around the user design and to take you what it is that we're doing with the program. So please welcome Huge to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Chris, uh, and thank you, everybody. So we're here to talk about this from a design perspective. Uh, and I'd like to start uh, by talking about, you know, answering the question, why are we focusing our design challenge on smartphones? They're not prevalent yet in developing markets. And why Android? So uh, smartphone, smartphones are increasingly the tool of choice uh, here, right, in, in the United States in developed markets. And they are penetrating uh, the rest of the world quite quickly, more rapidly than we've seen with any other technology. They, they're now comparable in terms of cost almost, so it's about $35 on average for a feature phone, and there's now a smartphone that's available for $80, uh, I believe, in China. So as we see smartphones begin to penetrate, uh, first-hand markets, they'll start to come down through second-hand markets as well and be more accessible worldwide. The other interesting piece is Android. So Android is a very flexible platform, as many of you know. Uh, developers love it. It's very powerful, and uh, it's actually penetrating the market far more uh, in developing markets than in the United States. So we, we felt like Really, in order to make an impact on these women's lives, we didn't want to focus on just what's happening today. We wanted to look to the future and give ourselves, give the designers enough chance to really think forward. Think about the power behind Android, uh, the idea that these smartphones will be a lot more accessible and affordable, and, and use that framework to design the right interface for these women. So uh, today, Marcelo and I will go over a couple of things. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to the barriers that, that these women face, which the video alluded to, and then we'll do a live demo with the phone so you can see uh, some of the interface uh, th things that you might want to consider, design considerations, in person. But first, as always, you want to start uh, with the people that we're designing for. So this is Stella. She's really a composite of uh, a reams and reams of research going out and talking to these women and understanding what, what their needs are. Uh, Stella is uh, a 35-year-old mother. She's a widow. She has four children and her son, one of her sons and her, uh, her sister live hours and hours away. So for her to make contact with them, she either has to travel or potentially use a phone. Now she is very, very uh, intimidated by phones, by, by the interface. She, she also has many cost barriers that I'll get into. But really for the designers in the audience and the de designers who will learn about this challenge, we always want to think about who we're designing for first and foremost. So the barriers. Uh, First of all, people like Stella and people in developing countries don't often uh, have, they're not fully literate. Now, I want to really dispel uh, an issue that we've come across in doing our research for this. Being, being somewhat illiterate or, or illiterate in quotes doesn't mean that you can't read and also doesn't mean that you're not smart. It just means that you haven't fully learned how to use a language, write it and read it thoroughly. So these women uh, can read and remember numbers, they can read and remember certain shapes, and they develop their own shortcuts, as many users in the United States do when they can't fully read an interface. So just to give you an example, maybe have us empathize a little bit, this is a, uh, an interface in Urdu and in Chinese. For, for me, I don't know these languages, so I have to rely on the iconography to understand uh, what, what I might be able to do, and it's quite overwhelming. So you can imagine for someone uh, who maybe doesn't even have the, some of the uh, ideas in their mind already of how some of these icons work, what a challenge this could be. So for us in the audience, uh, these might be simple icons that are easy to process and understand. Airplane, baseball, gasoline. But there was a study recently in India uh, in hospitals and they found that because there are 22 languages spoken in India, a lot of the population has varying degrees of literacy. So they found on average people were spending 30 minutes waiting in a hospital line that wasn't the right line for them. So you can imagine an already clogged hospital, uh, what, what costs and damage that's doing, to both to these people who are in a hospital setting, so they're already stressed out, but now they find out they're in the wrong line. So they started to develop and test some icons. I'll show you some of these. See if you can guess what these, remember these aren't things, tangible things like an airplane or baseball. These are con conceptual things. So see if you can guess what they are. Here's the answer. Uh, so you can imagine now the same kind of challenges that you have on, on the mobile interface. So now, uh, the other challenge that, that these women have is uh, low technical literacy. So many of them have never used any kind of phone. Some have used feature phones, uh, but m few, far fewer of them have ever seen or touched or used a smartphone. And that that's, can be very intimidating. Again, we see the same thing uh, in the work that, that our company does in the US. 
whenever there's a new technology, especially when it's tied to expenses and, and you don't know, you don't want to do something wrong and end up spending a lot of money or draining the battery. So it can be quite intimidating. So to put your, your mind in the context, this is the phone that most types of phones that most of these women may have used or seen used. So it's got a physical interface. Uh, you can kind of tell when you're making a call or not due to co the colors on the phone. Uh, and that, that's what they're used to. So then you juxtapose that against one of the most popular apps uh, in the Android store in news is this Pulse app. It's cool, it's powerful, you get a lot of stories and images in one. You can swipe across the side to get more stories and swipe up and down to move through different uh, news categories. But for, for someone to face an interface like this when they've never ever seen uh, a, a powerful interface, it can be quite intimidating. There's a lot of characters, a lot of language, a lot of figures. So for designers, you want to think about maybe minimizing the grid a little bit and, and maybe even just removing things from this interface. Another example that, that could be quite intimidating, this is another news app. This is actually an older version and they've made improvements on it. But this is the first thing you see when you open the app. It's a lot of instructions. Not only are they text instructions, but it's a lot of new gestures and things to think about. So that, those things can be quite intimidating. And, and even again, uh, in the US, people will open something like this and close it right away. If they don't get it right out of the gate, uh, they're going to move on. So an interface that, that uh, feels a little better uh, is uh, this one for mobile data uh, usage and monitoring. The, what we really liked about this example was the meter. Uh, it, it's easy to read, so you can imagine that applied to your power, your data usage. Also, there, there's color coding, so I can see that the New York Times app has used more uh, than other apps. So clear writing, clear text, a very friendly, simple interface, and, and very easy to, to process, even though it's a complex subject. Uh, so quickly, if you think about some of the other constraints, the cost, these devices uh, are a very large percentage, sometimes up to 20% of uh, someone's income in a developing market is spent just on mobile alone. Juxtapose that to about 1% for people uh, in more developed countries. Uh, then there's additional costs, the charging of the phone, the data, the SIM cards for multiple people to use it in one family. Uh, so it's, it's quite exponential. Then the data usage itself is something that is uh, really important to think about in this design challenge. So things like streaming video and audio, while they're really nice and, and fun and informative, it, they, dr they drive a lot of data usage. The same thing with uh, anything that requires a lot of polling, so a lot of uh, pings to another uh, database. And then finally, power consumption. So things like animations, uh, things that are location-based, all of those things drain a lot of the phone's power. And some of these women have to walk. They don't have electricity in their village. They have to walk in order to charge their phone. So these are all the considerations we'd like the designers to think about. It's an amazing challenge. Lots of constraints. So. Uh, Finally, Android's a really, really powerful platform, very flexible, but the meat of this challenge is actually to distill it down to its essentials so that it's a friendly interface for anyone who picks it up to use right away. Marcelo's now going to walk us through some examples. Okay, so I think the first thing you want to do is really show how Stella, the person that we are designing for, is going to face the UI. So I'm going to show you kind of a regular Android phone with regular UI, and you're going to see how actually daunting the experience can be at first. And then we're going to play around and show you other projects that are similar, that have a similar idea after this challenge, and then move back to Stella to say, how can we actually make this work just now here on stage, but then leaving the great, great uh, the, the design ideas to come from the challenge. So should we change? Can we to switch the, to the to the camera? There we All go. All right. So this is a standard Android interface, and imagine yourself like Stella looking at this. There are 20 individual choices you can make in just one screen, and that's one of the daunting things about Android as it is. It's so powerful, so raw power that we think that it can be daunting. And you saw in the video, this is one of the reasons why they actually don't want to use the phones. If they think of that for feature phones, imagine for this one. So you can see that there is a lot going on, a lot of things to do. And we, we keep saying, like, how do you tailor Android for other users? And a lot of entrepreneurs had already done that. So first, I'm going to show you how they adapt the UI for different users. So the first one is actually a different launcher. 
for the power users. So if you see from top to bottom, you, we have weather kind of standard for the US. We Brazilians, we don't use that. Then <laughs> we have the data consumption. He wants to know everything about his phone. He actually is uh, worried about two gigabytes or four gigabytes, but he wants to know while uh, Stella is probably worrying about bytes, not even megabytes. And then in the, in the bottom, imagine that even for us, this is amazing. This is how much beta you can save in several configurations. But th this is too much, even for most of the audience here. So what can we do to simplify and tailor the experience? That's the core of the challenge. Uh, just to show you another completely different take on the same problem, we have Big Launcher, who was made for the elderly. So we have a phone that is tailored for the elderly just to allow them to do what matters. There is no touch precision. See the, how big, how colorful things are. You can do actually one touch SOS. There is a timer. It's going to send an SOS message in 30 seconds. So we know that persons in times of need, they, maybe it's just one touch. But of course, they can actually uh, say, OK, I, I touched by, by mistake. There is a big cancel button here. And then you go back to the UI. So you see how people have already taken the challenge of designing for two completely different users. <laughs> and using Android to its whole power to allow them to do what they need. Look at this, it's just four or five things. So those are uh, a couple of examples uh, of launchers and you'll be able, we'll, at the end we'll share the, the website for you uh, to see where to go to learn more and also read more about, about the users. For now I'm gonna introduce uh, Maura O'Neill who is the Chief Innovation Officer at USAID uh, to move on to the next portion. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay. USAID has been a huge fan of the Social Good Summit. We're excited to see it grow, and we're also incredibly excited about uh, the opportunity for mobile phones to be a game changer, and we want to make sure that women, particularly poor women around the world, are not left behind. So I'm excited to have Dr. NASA, who is a real leader uh, uh, in this whole space, uh, QTEL, as well as Mikhail's joined us. So thanks so much. Thank we're going to just launch into the questions right away. So the way we've had this incredible explosion of mobile phone has been the private sector has invested and uh, and been uh, creative about business models that work for so many people around the world so tell us why is the private sector interested in poor women and what's in it for them it is really very simple you know by closing the gender gap we actually meeting and you know a gap in the market so again that would grow our customer base and would grow our business uh, as such. You know, we are very fortunate, you know, uh, as a company, we have roughly over 80 million customers in 17 markets. And most of these markets are in the developing uh, countries. And we have noticed that there is, you know, a huge gap in the gender, uh, you know, uh, needs. So that's why, you know, we are very excited to be a part of this program with GSMA and the M Women Initiative. And more or less, you know, uh, we were very excited, you know, yeah. to be part of this initiative and right. I can give you some numbers you know uh, yeah. in a minute. So we'll segue to that in just a second um, as we wrap up because you have been hugely uh, successful. So women are a market and remember that uh, all you mobile operators and others out there. Mikhail, give us just one quick hint to the people who want to win this challenge. Yes. What's the one piece of advice that you would give them to say remember to do what? Empathize, prioritize. I guess that's two things but uh, one, think about the users, think about the context. So we've gone over just a little bit here about Stella, but I would read more in depth and really get a feel for how these people are using the devices. They're outside, uh, they, they, you know, there's, there's daylight reflecting on, on the phone, all of those things, some of the touch target things that Marcelo talked about. And then the other piece is prioritizing. This design, as I mentioned, the challenge is about scraping away the non-essentials and really bringing to bear and bringing to front the things that matter to these people. It's not about getting fancy and moving around a lot. It's really about delivering the core essence of what these Great. women need. Great, thanks. So Dr. Nassau, one more question, and that is you've been hugely successful in grabbing women as customers in Iraq and Indonesia. How have you done that and what have you learned in targeting this population as a real market uh, for you? Uh, again, we started actually by doing a survey to understand what are the needs uh, of those women. When we started this, we found out that you know, women's penetration was 20%, even though the women you know, population in Iraq is around 50%. 
So there was a huge, you know, opportunity. Within a year, actually, we were able, you know, to increase that penetration from 20% to 30%, and we expect, you know, to reach roughly 40% by the end of 2012. In fact, we have been able to grow the, our customer base by 1.2 million customers just in one, in, in one year. That is in Iraq. And this is a program we called it uh, Al-Masa, which, uh -huh. is, which is actually diamond in Arabic, yeah. which is, you know, again, as I mentioned, it uh, was customized to the customer, you know, to the woman needs. Okay. The other one that we did in, was in Indonesia. Also, we were able to grow our customer base by 1.5 million customers within one year. Again, by again studying the market and understanding the needs of those women. So you've laid the gauntlet to the other mobile operators around the world. There's a market out there and a million and a half in one year. That's tremendous. So now I know that all of you would like to find out how do you get involved in this challenge? How do you get your kids, your friends, your colleagues um, to win this design challenge? And so I'd like to thank both of you and I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Jenny Duran from uh, uh, Australian Aid, who's going to tell you all how to get involved in this challenge. And thanks so much. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Um, so my task is to tell you how to get involved in this design challenge. But before I do that, I just want to say how pleased and delighted um, Australia is to be part of the uh, M Women initiative with USAID and uh, Visa and uh, the GSM Association. Um, it's doing really, really important work, um, bringing services to women that wouldn't otherwise have access to them. And in the part of the world that I come from, the Asia Pacific, there is still a really huge gap between uh, men and women's access to mobile phones. Um, and so if we give them access um, to those mobile phones and we give them access to the services uh, um, that those mobile phones can provide, they can make a quantum leap forward. Um, it really empowers them to do things like um, access health services where in some places it would take days uh, to travel to a health centre. Um, as we heard from Chris before, you know, to... to, to um, uh, uh, to do all manner of things and, and, uh, and as we heard from Huge, you know, to make those services accessible in a way uh, that they can uh, uh, easily get to them, um, to, uh, to do their banking, um, to uh, access um, uh, markets. Um, so it's a really, really important initiative and one that we're very, very pleased to be part of, all at the touch of a button. Um, this design challenge is, um, is really significant. Um, it, it's all about breaking down the barriers um, for women and, uh, and especially targeting those women who are poorest and most marginalised. Um, so that they too can take the, the um, advantage of the opportunities that we have available to us. Um, so it's my very, very great pleasure to, uh, uh, to open the design challenge. Um, we, uh, we invite all of you designers out there to, uh, to take it up. Um, and uh, you can enter by um, accessing um, the information uh, on the uh, website that you see on, on the screen there. And we, we look forward to seeing some of the great innovations that can come out of, uh, of a challenge like this. Innovations that are exciting of themselves but have the capacity to benefit millions and millions of women right around the world. Um, and just so you know, uh, if you enter, when you'll find out uh, whether you've been successful, the successful entries will be announced at the Mobile World Conference in uh, Barcelona in February uh, 2013. Uh, so good luck, everyone, and, um, and I hope you'll uh, get on board and join the challenge. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Sharon from Mashable. Over the past two days, our partner Ericsson has held a social good hackathon downtown at 92Y Tribeca. And that hackathon is now concluding and they're gonna start uh, judging. And we're gonna do our final check-in now before they start judging and tomorrow we'll be announcing the winners. So now for our final check-in, we're gonna check in with Jeff over at 92Y. Jeff, how's it going? How's the energy over there and what are you excited about? 
Hey Sharon, thank you very much. Yes, as you say, you can see behind us, actually, if I lean out of the way, just the start of the presentations. Uh, and, and if we just take a little bit of a step back and remember that at 10 o'clock, the, the previous speakers actually reminded me exactly of how we opened this hackathon. Uh, 10 o'clock yesterday morning. Focus on simplicity, focus on the end user, and in reality, the, the most powerful piece of equipment you have at the start in designing the experiences is a piece of paper and the pen. So since then, all of us, uh, about 100 of us, have really lived in this room. Uh, many people were still coding uh, when they left until 3 o'clock in the morning. They came back, had been working hard, been preparing their pictures uh, that they're just starting to give. And to fill you in on the process now, so you can follow along a little bit, uh, we have approximately 25 teams, and they're all going to give a three-minute pitch. And as we, as we follow those pitches for the judges, we'll actually tweet those out to SGS Global so all of you can follow in real time the kinds of ideas that come out of the hackathon. Hoping to finish that about 9.30, 10 o'clock, judges will go away and actually select the winners. And then at about 10.30, we're hoping again through the same tweet that we'll do the announcements of the winners uh, uh, in real time live over the social media. Some ideas that we're seeing coming through that we'll hear more of hopefully. Uh, we heard one earlier, the voting application that empowers people to make decisions quickly across distributed organizations. We have another idea around the video, uh, collaborating over video very easily, very quickly. Uh, one about healthcare and managing the distribution of innovative healthcare solutions that are happening inside developing countries for developing countries and trying to shorten the distance between the people who have ideas and the people who need the ideas to be in a better life. A few ideas. Uh, we're going to go straight back once I finish up here and uh, join the judging panel uh, and we'll be in touch through uh, uh, Twitter and the hashtags. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jeff. For our next session, Deborah Dugan, CEO of Red, and John Steinbeck, VP Marketing at Foursquare, will sit down for a conversation on location-based services and social good. But before they start, we're going to show a quick video. For 40 cents, I got an egg. I got gum. <laughs> I got bubbles. I got a hairnet. A kazoo. A candy necklace. An orange. A band-aid. For 40 cents, I got one of these. I got a really great hat. Fabric softener. I got half a song. The stamp. A ponytail. Helium. Some bling. Some fries. Balloon dog. This much of a Shirley Temple. This much eyeshadow. Extra mayonnaise. Earplugs. I got a mustache. 40 cents buys you this much of a manicure. An apple. Sprinkles. 15 minutes of parking and a ticket. <laughs> Lipstick. Two pills a day is what it takes to stay alive if you're HIV positive. Those pills cost about 40 cents a day. Lunch bag. It was quite wonderful to be backstage and to actually hear the laughter around that video. Um, and I know when I first saw it, I sent it to a lot of my friends. Red, as an organization, gets social media. You guys were the first ones with a million followers on Facebook and a million followers on Twitter. Can you tell me about the la what the last six years have been like and your approach to all this? Well, it's interesting because I think many people remember the launch of Red um, where Bono, 
and Bobby Shriver were really responding for, uh, to a crisis and saying, uh, it's an emergency, hence the color red. Um, and the global fund, which had public sector financing, like world leaders and, and uh, governments and countries giving money, wanted the private sector companies to give money. Uh, but in the first few years, there was five billion coming from countries and only five million from corporations. So the brand came about, and I think people are familiar with the model, that if you buy the red iPod Touch October 1st, um, or uh, you know, these red Beats, I, I'm shameless about product, <laughs> um, a red Mophie for your iPhone, whatever, um, up to 50% goes to Fight AIDS primarily in Africa. And um, we just started evolving the model to say, that's good, but there's probably so many other ways you could be read. Uh, and we love the idea that you could take any kind of digital action that would result in a real world action. So that's why we, we came to you um, with the campaign that Foursquare did with us, and maybe you could talk about that a little. Yeah, definitely. So are, are any of you guys familiar with Red Rush or the, or the campaign we did? Uh, I've seen a lot of nodding out there. The basic idea behind this was for a 10-day period in early June, if you checked in to some of Red Partners, it was Starbucks and Bugaboos um, and Penfolds, Penfold uh, it would trigger a donation to the Red Foundation, a dollar donation. And the really amazing thing we saw, we're, we're huge data nerds at Foursquare, so we, we look at everything really closely. And in that 10-day period, we actually saw almost a 30% increase in check-ins to Starbucks. And it was a lot of new people who've never been there before. It was a lot of friends who people, of people who checked in and saw that donation and then went to check in themselves to trigger that donation. Um, so we saw that we were actually able to change the dialogue a little bit and prompt that sort of action in the real world. Yeah, and it was great for Starbucks. Uh, they love the campaign um, and you know it was just above the napkins where it said you know red rush to zero that right now a thousand women a day pass on HIV to their babies and we've pretty much eliminated that in the United States and Europe but it's still rampant in Africa and so we said like can it be zero and the answer is you know it can be zero it's will we get to zero is more the issue so we try to have youth be able to take some action that triggers a corporation which has deeper pockets to give. Um, and there's lots of innovative ways that we do that. Um, and then we try to use the magnifying power. So um, we reached 3 million in our, you know, I, I think we have 1.3 now on Facebook and, and Twitter. And, and we tell them to take an action, but then we also go to the employees of the red companies and say, take this action. Then we go to the social media of Starbucks, Coca-Cola, Apple, Converse, and we say, you know, take this action. And then we get a few celebrities to help us out uh, and get Aston Kutcher, uh, uh, Tiesto, uh, David Guetta, you know, to tweet and say, take this action. So last World AIDS Day, 300 million we reach uh, by just using social media. So the whole idea of using social media to promote social justice just makes so, so much sense and I think it's very underdeveloped. Yeah. And I think one of the, like the central thesis of Foursquare is that people want to connect with the places they are and do that in a social way. And I think one of the interesting things com that comes from that is not just are you at a restaurant or are you at a bar, but you know, here you are at the 92nd Street Y and why are you here and what do you want to tell your friends and the people who follow you about that. Um, and I know, I, even though the service is a little spotty in here, when I checked in here, there were a lot of you checked in. Um, Raise your hand if you checked in at Foursquare. Oh, awesome, look at so that. So we got a lot of hands. Okay, so if Foursquare gave $10 for 100 people checking in here, that'd be a, that'd be $1,000. That'd be... Sure, let's do that. That'd be, um, so everybody should check in anyway. It's probably more than your T&E for this trip though, right? <laughs> we'll figure it out. But I mean, that's the, that's the sort of thing we're talking about is like, how do you, how do you embed yourself in the conversation? Like yeah. the, the nice thing about this campaign is you have people who want to share where they are. You have businesses that want that relationship with their customers. And what we found out, and the data totally validated this, was that it's, it's perfectly viable for a cause to insert themselves into that relationship. 
You know, that this is a win-win-win. It was a win for Starbucks and Penfolds and Bugaboo. It was a win for the person because they got to prompt that action. And it's a huge win for you guys because you have a record number of tweets out there from this action with our very young and digital community. You have the actual donations that are being triggered to your foundation. Yes, so 250,000 people in eight days checking in gave just under 2,000 people a year of uh, uh, the medication that they need that otherwise would have died. So it's, you know, it, it's like, what can we do next? It's so amazing. Yeah. Um, and we actually, we saw a lot of cool dynamics when we dug a bit further in the data for this campaign. One of them was a record number of new people checked into Starbucks. Another one was that when you checked into Starbucks, your friends were much more likely to check into Starbucks because they saw that social impact. And I think one of the things that we think about as we think about social action in the real world, it's, it's how do you push that further down the funnel? You know, how do you prompt more action? So instead of just checking in and saving a dollar, what if that donation was compounded for every future, for every one of your friends that checked in? Would that change the way that you push that out onto social networks? Would that change the way that you broadcast where you are? Um, and, and can it, you reward them? So how do you at Foursquare like reward people who go to the gym? Yeah. What do they get? Yeah. And they the, get like a badge? Yeah, they get a badge. Okay. And it's, okay. So it's you like should get a badge for doing social good. It should make you feel good. And that was one of the central theses. Uh, I think uh, Foursquare came along and we invented a lot of aspects of this new gamification space. But it was never about gamification. It was about tapping into motivations. Like somebody's more likely to go to the gym if there's the social pressure and if they know that if they check in 10 times in a month that they get that badge. And we can do that for a lot of different things. We can do that for cool things. We can do that for fun things. But for me, what's most exciting is when we can do that for something cause-related. And I think it's, it's very similar to the original thesis of, Red, thesis of Red, is can you inject Red into the conversations that wouldn't be happening otherwise? Oh, I mean, absolutely. What ended up happening on that campaign is that uh, Red is a division of the One campaign, which is more lobbying and advocacy. So people checked in, and then they met, and then they signed petitions uh, at Starbucks throughout the country. So it affected even greater political action than just going there. I mean, Starbucks was happy because you just went there, you checked in, you didn't have to buy coffee, and it triggered a donation. But who goes into Starbucks and smells the coffee? And doesn't buy a coffee, right? I mean, so it's really <laughs> going to happen. Uh, but I could see Foursquare, um, which links so much real-world activity, driving so much at point of sale or for events, because Red does you know, so many great events, um, where you can get people to take that initial action, then reward them, have them feel good. Maybe it's some kind of social currency. Maybe it's... Uh, uh, you know, points on a Zenga game or something that again involves social media, and um, and then have it multiplied to your point. Yeah. And that's, I, I feel like that social ecosystem is incredibly important. Like, you know, I, I was sitting uh, in the back there before and I just saw the stream of tweets coming from this. And you see my Facebook friends posting about it as well. And I think we think of Twitter, and I'm going to use a gross overgeneralization here, but Twitter as this network for interests and Facebook as this, network, ne as this network for friends and what your friends are doing. And we look at Foursquare really when you're not in front of a computer, when you're actually out in the real world performing actions. Um, that's, this is your network for sharing those sorts of actions and what results from those actions. And that's why I think we're really excited about the future of what we can do through you. Obviously, Red Rush was the first step in that. Um, but it feels like a powerful network for that sort of thing. And it is. And it's a time when um, millennials, I, I think, have this great sense of social justice that some things just should not be. So you could be a truck driver in Texas and say, OK, if there's enough food on the planet, for everybody, then why are people starving? And through me, you know, social media, that person can actually have a voice and, and make that statement where I think it would have been ignored. And if you match that sensibility with the time of where corporations are, where they have to give back. I mean, it's, it, it's part of their DNA now, whereas when I was growing up, it was Ben and & Jerry's and Paul Newman, and that was kind of it. Now every company has to stand for something, and stand for something good, because this generation demands it. So when you have that happening, I mean, you know, for me, I watch the evolution of um, 
because I, I worked at uh, Disney and EMI Records and a lot of big companies. And at first, there was a corner office for somebody who was head of digital. And then they, everybody realized, oh my god, everything's digital. There was a corner office for the philanthropy person uh, who did the social causes. Now every company says, oh my god, wait a minute, that's who we are, um, and not just a, a side foundation. So. Um, when you link those things and the great advances in technology and how people can communicate, that connection can make such unbelievable social change. Um, you know, we have uh, the CGI meetings and the UN meetings uh, this week, and there's panels on how does business fight poverty and get involved. Um, there's uh, a lot of talk about the new UN Millennium Goals. So every 15 years there are goals that the countries would decide on and say, okay, we're going to give half the world access to clean water. And then everybody rallies and tries to get that done. Um, nobody knows about them. And you know, here we had the Coney video that was to make Coney famous, but maybe those goals should be famous. And um, I know that uh, the one organization is going to bring up maybe the world should vote. Maybe the world's poorest people who now have access to cell phones and can text should vote on what those goals should be. That was impossible 15 years ago. So the um, amount of momentum and the amount of uh, being able to capture everybody's voice for social change is staggering and, and we've just started. I mean, it's just sort of the tip of the iceberg of what it could be. Yeah. And for me, it's, it's really exciting that this validated the idea of location as a platform for that as well. Um, so I guess just in closing, what's next for you guys? What, what are you looking forward to? Well, you, I, I have to embarrass John. He's actually worked in AIDS clinics, um, you know, which just like in Africa, which totally like blew me away in the green room. Um, and so, you know, we are um, really trying to uh, get to a financial goal, and it's very, very aggressive. But in a relatively short period of time, Red has raised $196 million for the Global Fund, and that fights t tuberculosis, AIDS, and malaria, all preventable diseases that, you know, like polio, if we took the right actions, we could reduce and actually get off the planet. Um, so we do these campaigns. World AIDS Day is the next one. I know you like to dance. What if something, what if through Foursquare we had um, dance parties and you found out where they were and you found out what you could do and you check in and that ends up helping somebody in Africa live. Um, so stay tuned, but I think we'll be dealing with each other again very soon. Excellent. Thank you. Cool. All right. It is my pleasure to introduce Beth Cantor, blogger, master trainer, and author. Today, Beth will be speaking about social change from the inside out. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> I'm going to get right to it because I have limited time and a lot to talk about you. But I have this amazing work that I do and that I'm passionate about. I get to teach people who work for NGOs and change makers how to use these tools to connect to on the ground change. And I get to do it all over the world. And it's amazing. It's my passion. And I've been doing it for a long time. I didn't invent the internet, but um, I started around 1992. And, and I, all I can say is the technology changes a lot faster than people and a lot faster than organizations, but I'm hopeful. So, and it's changed quite a bit in the last five years, and that's a photo of me in Cambodia. And do you know that I was the first person to raise money on Twitter back in 2007? There was a group of bloggers in Cambodia, and they wanted to do a conference, but they didn't have any money. So I used my blog and I used Twitter to raise money, go over there and teach, and we had the conference. But you know what, the internet there was really slow. And in fact, it was satellites. And in the afternoon when it would rain, the satellites would fill with water and there went the Wi-Fi. Really frustrating. But I had a chance to go back there because I took my beautiful kids who were adopted from Cambodia on a homeland visit. And the internet has dramatically changed. You can get 3G in rural areas. Just amazing, amazing transformation in five, 
short years. So we were able to, I was able to introduce my kids to this woman, Lang Saparoth, who my early experiments in social fundraising from 2006 until she graduated in 2010 sent her to college. And it helped her make a better life, helped her avoid some of the perils of the sex trade, sex trafficking that you had heard of. And my kids got to meet her. But you know what was different? They'd actually connected with her on Facebook before. And I got to uh, have a reunion with those bloggers. They got to meet my kids. And we were in Phnom Penh, and we had to take um, a taxi up to Siem Reap, Angkor Wat. And the safety standards there are different than they are in the US. So I had uh, Mon Cole, the blogger, write this note out in Khmer, because the taxi drivers don't speak very good English. No English speak. And it says, we are not in a hurry to get to Siem Reap. Please drive safely and slowly. We want to live a long life. <laughs> and I gave it to them and he smiled and we got to Siem Reap safely and climbed to the top of Top Brook and saw the sun set over Angkor Wat. It was amazing. But then there was the trip back. A little scary. It looked like this. The roads are kind of scary. They, they're driving, they pass, and it looks like an, it's going to hit the bus. So I distracted myself. Thank God I had 3G, and I got on Facebook. <laughs> and I posted a status update that said, gee, I wish I had a sign in Khmer that said, don't talk on your cell phone while you're driving. Because <laughs> not only was he passing at a crazy rate, he was talking on his cell phone. And with a minute, my friends in Cambodia sent me a sign, posted it on Facebook that said, don't talk on your cell phone while you're driving. I tapped them on the shoulder, showed it to them, and we made it back. So, okay, so, okay, so my point is, it's not about the tools, it's what you do with them. And what I try to tell nonprofits when I talk about cha social change from the inside out, it's connecting it to networks for on the ground social change. Um, you know, we've heard this all through the last day and today, you know, social change is about connecting with networks and inspiring people and getting them connected to take, do on the ground change. And what I, and all of you know that, and all of you are leaders in that, but many times, but you, we all, we can't do it alone. We need to work in partnership with NGOs, with government, with others. So when I'm talking to NGO leaders, um, and uh, who may not be in this room, um, I talk about you have to lead with a network mindset. And that's about being open, transparent, building relationships, and welcoming young change makers who are proficient with these skills, like all of you in the audience, who can start social movements in the palms of your hands, and to join hands and to work together for on the ground change. Great, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Launsky Tiefenthal. I'm the new UN Under Secretary General for Communications and Public Information. And I was asked to introduce uh, Jane Goodall, but I get that she doesn't really need any introduction. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I thought I'd quickly share with you what uh, Jane Goodall means to me. Um, a couple of days ago, uh, Jane Goodall addressed a large gathering of young people at uh, UN Day for Peace. And at the end of her presentation, she recreated the greeting sound of a chimpanzee. And it reminded me of uh, my younger sister and myself many, many years ago accompanying my dad to the forests uh, south of Vienna, where he tried very, very hard to explain to us the different sounds of a stag, a deer, a fox. Uh, and he taught us how to appreciate nature, to recognize a leaf, a tree, the footprint of a stag, a deer, a fox. Um, and it took us many, many years to really appreciate that. Uh, much, much later, at that time, we thought that was boring. We wanted to do something else. 
And when I heard now about the Roots and Shoots program of uh, Jane Goodall, where she manages to attract the attention of hundreds of thousands of young people around the world for exactly that purpose, to appreciate nature, to respect uh, flora and fauna, I found that even more remarkable at a time where social media, cell phones, short message systems, uh, Twitter accounts interrupt you constantly and try to grab your attention. And uh, that's my way of expressing admiration for Jane Goodall. Thank you. Do you think that after his introduction, we should start off with the greeting call of the wild chimpanzee? I think he's given us no option. <laughs> because Go now on. you're all curious. So, and I'm going to teach it to everybody. Are you going to learn it too? I'll try. Okay, so <laughs> listen because we call it a pantoot because it's a hoo, hoo. So listen and then we'll all do it together, okay? Now, come. So what have we just said to each other? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh, great. <okay. laughs> and also, I said, I'm me, Jane. And you said, you're me, you. Me, Tarzan, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us briefly, as we're all getting to know each other, who, who am I sitting next to as well? Uh, Mr. H, he, probably some of you know him. He's very famous, given to me by a man who went blind called Gary Horn. So he's Mr. H. And Gary decided he'd be a magician and was told it was impossible. And he said, well, I can try. And he's so good that the people wouldn't know he was blind if he was here now. And then at the end, he says, you know, things may go wrong in your life. You never know, but don't give up. And he climbs Mount Kilimanjaro, jumps out of airplanes, thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee. And you know, don't you, that he's got a tail, so he's not a chimpanzee. I hope you know that. I do now. Yeah. <laughs> so he said, never mind, take him where you go, and I'm with you in spirit. So he's been with me for 16 years, 59 countries, touched by at least 4 million people, because I say the inspiration rubs off. Brilliant. Right, better touch him. There we are. Mr. H. So, Jane, you, you, you're obviously known to this audience here, but and as, as people tune in around the world to this conversation, what would be the one thing that, you know, as you look at your work over the years, the one thing that you hope the younger generation today you know, will learn from what you've, what you've found, if you had to share one, one insight? That well, if I have to share one thing about the chimpanzee research, per se, you know, when I first went to Cambridge University, because I started chimps with no degree of any sort, and Louis Leakey told me I had to get a PhD, so I was a bit nervous. And I got there, and I was told by the professors, who I was in awe of, that I'd done everything wrong. I couldn't talk about the chimps having personalities, minds, or emotions. Those were unique to us. I should have given them numbers rather than names. And fortunately, I thought back to the teacher I had as a child who taught me that wasn't true, that animals did have personalities, minds, and feelings, and that was my dog, Rusty. And so I think that the most important thing that I've been able to share because of the chimps is that there's no sharp line between us and the rest of the animal kingdom. We are part of it. And we should respect animals, particularly those with reasonably complex brains, and you know, give them the respect that's their due. Now, as you look at the relationship between humans and the rest of the animal kingdom, what would be the one area where we're doing best and what's the area that we're doing worst in terms of our communication and respect? Well, uh, there's no question but that, uh, you know, chimpanzees biologically are unbelievably like us, the structure of the brain and everything. But our human intellect has exploded 
and it doesn't make sense to compare. Even the brightest chimp who can learn 400 signs of American Sign Language use them in correct, you know, um, correct context. Uh, it doesn't make sense to compare that intellect with that of ours, where we have a little robot up on Mars, for heaven's sake, taking photographs. So, so we've done amazingly well with our intellect and what we can do with our brain, but then look at the other side. How is it that this intellectual creature is destroying its only planet? So the bad that we've done is to use our brain for some amazing things, but also weapons of mass destruction, and the way we lead our lives every day. We, we are leaving a way too heavy environmental footprint on this planet. Uh, do you think that message is starting to get across, or do you think we're getting worse? Uh, it's, I think it's starting to get across. I'm very encouraged by some CEOs of major corporations who really are beginning to make change, and sometimes it's for the bottom line. It's because of, they want a green image. Uh, I don't care what they do it for as long as they do it. And uh, through our youth program, which is now in 131 countries, that there's no question but that young people, uh, not only in our program, but many, many programs around the world are beginning to understand because it's their future. You know, you hear, we haven't inherited this planet from our parents, we borrowed it from our children. We haven't borrowed anything, we have stolen. You and I have stolen from the great-grandchildren of this planet. And so, just tell us briefly about your youth organization. What, what, where do people find that? Um, well, what's a, it doing? It's called, it's called Roots and Shoots. And it's, you can find it on the website. This is a, a web sort of thing, rootsandshoots.org. And basically, it's groups of young people getting together, talking about what disturbs them, about what's going wrong in the world choosing between them three kinds of project, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment, and it can be all in one. And then rolling up their sleeves and getting out and taking action. So it's, it, it began in Tanzania with 12 high school students. It's now in 131 countries with members from preschool all the way through university, all sharing, all sharing an understanding of the fact that every single day we live we make an impact on this planet, and we have a choice. Now, we were talking um, earlier about um, the fact that there are chimpanzees, even in the US, that are still being used in medical research. And, 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 I mean, you've, and you've been engaged in a, a dialogue around the ethics of that. Could you just talk us through what's going on there? Yes, well, you know, the first time I actually went into a medical research lab, I, I, was, I, kind of, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Chimpanzees, our closest relatives, very social, highly intelligent, in five foot by five foot cages alone, bleak, barren cages. Maybe there was a motor tire, and maybe they were there for 40, 50 years or more, because they can live to be 60. And I, I just couldn't believe it. Well, fortunately, as medical science and science has evolved, it's become increasingly obvious that less and less and less is there any any kind of need for using chimpanzees to learn about human uh, disease, to seek for cures and vaccines. And fortunately, the National Institutes of Health initiated uh, a review of the use of chimpanzees in medical research. And I was able to be involved in talking with them and testifying. Uh, and they have now announced that the first 110 chimpanzees will be retired permanently and they expect many others to be retired because the the uh, medical uh, council has said most work research with chimps is not necessary so do you think ultimately i mean how many are there still oh there's still 580 left mm. and it's going to be a big problem to to care for them because once they leave medical research they need a nice uh, you know sanctuary and that's something that we're all going to have to work for. Now, if you were um, starting out today as, with the same kind of hum humanitarian and, and, and ecological concerns, where would you be going 
And what, what, what would be the project that you would want to take on? I don't know, because, you know, the more I've learned as I, as I go through this long life, learning about the different environmental and social problems, is how everything's interconnected. And, you know, so all the programs that we, the Jane Goodall Institute, have done have been very holistic. And initially I was criticized. You can't, working with poverty around the wilderness areas, you can't do it all. You can't do education and farming and, and uh, water projects. You've got to choose. But how do you choose when there's nobody but you? You have to, you have to, you know, make people healthy, but then they die because there's no sanitation, and you educate them, but there's not enough food. It's all interrelated, and so that, like our Roots and Shoots program, is very holistic. And knowing what I know now, it's it's all about trying to tackle three seemingly impossible problems which somehow we have to solve. One is the terrible poverty. People living in poverty will destroy the environment in their desperate efforts to get food. Um, and secondly, it's the unsustainable lifestyle of the rest of us. And you know, it was Gandhi who famously said, the planet can provide enough for human need, but not for human greed. And then on top of all of that, sort of binding them together is this continual human population growth. So it, it's, that's what we Um, I know, I believe uh, Mohammed Yunus was here earlier today. He took me to Bangladesh and I saw his uh, microcredit, the Grameen Bank. So one of our most successful programs has been microcredit for groups of women and scholarships to keep girls in school. Well, tell us a bit, about, a bit more about chimpanzees and their likeness to humans. Uh, do they have a good sense of humor? <laughs> yes, they do actually. <laughs> I mean, I can best illustrate that um, with a story. It's actually about a gorilla, but you know, it's a, one of the great apes. And this was a gorilla, Coco, very famous. And she'd been taught signs for all the different colors. And this young woman was uh, quite new to the program. And she's been told, occupy Coco while her supper's got ready. So she's picking up, you know, what color is this? It's blue. Coco's making the signs. What color is, you know, this? It's green. This is brown. And, then she picks up a white cloth, say this is a white cloth, and Coco signs red. And the young woman signs back, oh Coco, you know that's not true, it's red. Coco, if you don't tell me what color this is, you won't get your apple juice for supper. So Coco picks up the white cloth. She picks off a teeny piece of red fluff. She goes, red, red, red. <laughs> <laughs> sense of humor and you see it in the chimps all the time um, you know and they they can feel the same kind of emotions we can happiness sadness fear, even embarrassment 
Uh, they have uh, long-term supportive family bonds. There are good mothers, there are bad mothers. Uh, they, they use tools and in different parts of Africa there are different tool usages where young ones learn from their parents which is a, a kind of culture. And They're not on Twitter yet though, are they? <laughs> no, that's the, this <laughs> intellect of ours, that's the difference. But they can do amazing things on computers, just incredible. Like and, what? Well, they can, they can learn symbols for different words and they can use these symbols. They can also memorize the position of uh, numbers on a screen. If you then make the screen blank, they can press back the numbers either in ascending or descending order up to nine, things like that. But they can't do Twitter. Thing is, they haven't developed a spoken, sophisticated language. And of course, parrots can speak somebody in the audience who has a parrot who just said his 1,000, I can't remember, about 1,600 and something word in a proper context. Um, but with the chimpanzees so like us, they can show love, compassion, real altruism. And it was so shocking to me when I found they also showed violence and even killing. And I mean, is there um, a lesson in terms of how they organize and how they behave that you would want to see us learn that we haven't mastered as a, as a human race? I think one thing they're really better at than a lot of us is resolving conflict. They hate, my grandmother used to teach me that you should never let the sun set on your anger. And the chimpanzees are like that, they hate it when there's tension. And they will, even if they're, you know, there's no right and wrong, might is right. So the victim is just feeling terrible and the victim will go up and make submissive gestures and basically beg for a reassuring touch. And so if I beg to you for a reassuring touch, you will pat me gently or you will embrace me or kiss me. Mm -hmm. And so the conflict is resolved and host social harmony is restored. They're really good at that. Well, I think on that lesson for what we can learn. Unfortunately, our time has already oh dear. run by, but Jane Goodall, thank you so much for sharing with us, and uh, brilliant to meet you. Thank you. Good to meet you, too. And a chimp oh, yeah. greeting. <laughs> thank you very much. We now have an amazing presentation to finish, us, finish off the evening from um, Apple Juice Kids. We're about to try an experiment, ladies and gentlemen. Bear with us. So joining Apple Juice Kid in what must be a world first, the great Jane Goodall.
All right. <laughs> that was so fun. <laughs> that was so fun. All right, so uh, <laughs> I'm like the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. I'm so excited. Uh, but that, what that was, that, what that collaboration is something we like to call beat making. And uh, this is Apple Juice Kid. He's been DJing for y'all tonight. Have y'all been enjoying the music tonight? All right. My name is Professor Pierce Freelon. We teach in the music department at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And the, cla the class that we teach, Go Heels, the class that we teach is called a beat making lab. And this summer, we took that beat making lab curriculum and built a studio and a beat making lab in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, if I could think of one word to describe uh, our work in the Congo, uh, it would be power. And I wanna share three really quick stories with you about um, our relationships with power in the Congo. Uh, number one is power as in electricity, literally the power grid. We would be in the studio with these young students from a nonprofit called Yole Africa, and the power would cut out. Uh, and you know, sometimes we go three hours, four hours, six hours, 12 hours with absolutely no power. Uh, so for a program where we're building a studio in a community, uh, we had to be cognizant of the power issues. So we used uh, laptops and bus powered microphones so that uh, when the power went out, which was inevitable, it was gonna happen, uh, it didn't interrupt the creative process. So that's the first uh, element of power. The second is political power. I don't know how many of you were paying attention to the news uh, this summer, but uh, there was a, a militant group called M23 that was in conflict with the government, or with the uh, military in uh, DRC. And um, I mean, we would have security briefings every morning and they say, uh, Apple Juice, Mr. Freelon, um, the rebels are 60 kilometers outside of the city, and, uh, but don't worry, they're, they're not gonna get any closer to Goma. And then the next morning it would be like, okay, the rebels are 20 kilometers out of the city, uh, but don't worry, we're, we're good, we're good. And uh, you know, the next day, lo and behold, 12 kilometers outside of the city. So for us as facilitators, uh, you know, the political struggles were relevant to the work that we were doing, but even more so for the students who are living in an area where there's conflict going on with the government and militant groups. Uh, it was something that was uh, very powerful and influenced their music, uh, which brings me to the third element of power, uh, which was the power of the students' voices. Uh, if you listen to the lyrics, to the songs, to the raps that these young brothers and sisters in DRC were singing, they were just so moving, so powerful, and the beats were very powerful as well. So we wanna share with you a little clip uh, from our work there, and so you can hear it from the voices of our students themselves. Can you roll the clip from the uh, Yole Africa, please? J'aime trop faire le beat making parce que je suis un artiste et musicien. When I'm now, I am in the studio, I'm feeling like uh, I am in the event, like that because I love so much the music. Is that? Mes avertissements, mes voix c'est mon triste, ma piste, ma devant rap, ma je rap de la mal, ma mais c'est du rap, ma respect. En fait, c'est ma prof qui m'a donné dans le jugement de la phrase, il m'a recherché ça, il m'a délaissé, il m'a fondé, il m'a fondé, il m'a fondé, il m'a fondé, il m'a fondé. Je sais que quand ils, ils iront aux États-Unis, pour nous ça ne sera pas une fin, ça sera plutôt une continuité ou bien un début pour nous, enfin que nous puissions apprendre d'autres artistes à créer leurs propres instrumentaux. So those are some images from our work in Congo this summer. Um, oh yeah, you can clap, you can totally clap. That's clap worthy. <laughs> so um, one of the ways we want to expand and build on what we did in Congo is by building an open source beat making software. Uh, we're from North Carolina and we partnered with uh, opensource.com and Red Hat to uh, help nurture a community of coders and uh, digital activists, we call them, to help us work on building this software. So that's one thing. If you know anyone in the tech world, uh, please reach out to us. We, we need help and support uh, to build an open source beat making software. 
And that's, uh, you know, our vision for the program is to have our students in Congo collaborating with our students at UNC, sending beats to new labs in Senegal and Kenya and in India and, uh, you know, in Brazil, so we can have an interconnected web of beat makers. Um, but I'm, I'm done talking. I'm kind of, I'm tired of hearing myself talk. We're about to get into some music. Y'all ready for some music? All right. So we're going to introduce y'all to some Goma culture. Goma, Congo, that's where we did the lab. So if you're, if you're in the middle, uh, you know, if you're in downtown Goma and you yell out, cho, 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 then somebody's going to respond, cho, just like that. So uh, we're going to try that out. Uh, it's call and response. Cho, 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 cho. Cho, 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 cho. Cho, 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 cho. Cho, 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 cho. Okay, good, you got it. So um, that, that's just a little glimpse of Goma culture. Now what uh, Apple Juice is about to play a beat that we made in the studio. You might have heard it in the background of the video, but this is the beat, uh, the culminating uh, product uh, of our beat making lab was the creation of this beat. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna perform a verse over it, which is in English and Swahili. So if you don't speak Swahili, there's some people out here who do. We can translate for you after the show. But again, this is a beat created by our students in Congo in a sustainable lab that remains in Goma for sustainable community use. Check it out. All right, y'all. Proper beat etiquette is to nod your head when you hear a hot beat. Everybody follow Apple Juice Kids example. All right, here's my verse. Goma, well my people need a money. Peace is what you need when we stand up. The time is now. Sandy Wakati, they see me in ass. Una Toka Wapi, where you from? Carolina, but I'm really an African son. How does the African son? Freedom's about to be won. If we get you clapping your hands, nobody's clapping the gun. Uh, poa poa, sawa sawa, and dugu zangu, can you feel me? Sawa sawa. <laughs> All right, Apple Juice. Gonna throw up some thoughts. Thank you so much. My name is Stephen Levitin, otherwise known as Apple Juice Kid. We had Pierce Freelon. I'm gonna let you introduce yourself. We had a, an amazing percussionist. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I'm Noelia, nice to meet you. I have my Uruguayan uh, drums with me, and I'm very grateful for you guys and everyone. Long live music. Wasn't she awesome? Give her a round of applause. <laughs> All right, so if you want to know more about uh, the way we combine artists with nonprofits and the Beat Making Labs, beatmakinglab.com. And uh, it was so amazing to be here. Thank you to everyone for this wonderful event. Thank you all so much. <laughs> well, thank you again, the uh, Apple Juice Kid. Thank you very much. And uh, making a star of Jane Goodall, finally. Um, <laughs> So, uh, unfortunately, our time is now up here tonight, and so I'd like to first of all thank everyone here uh, for coming along this evening, everyone around the world for joining in, and for all the amazing ideas and uh, actions that are going to come out of this Social Good Summit. Um, things start again uh, at 8 a.m. Uh, tomorrow in Mogadishu and Nairobi, where you can come here and watch the live streaming of the conversation from there. First thing on stage here is at 11 a.m. where Janet Napolitano is going to be here. And um, if you are at home and um, wanting to keep yourself awake through the night, at 2 a.m. Uh, you can come to the website and find a live stream from Beijing of the conversation going on there. And uh, everything's being uh, translated into many languages, so you'll be able to follow it very well. Um, so with no further ado, I thank you all again and uh, say do follow me at Matt Bish on Twitter, uh, read The Economist and uh, lots of other things like that. So thank you very much and see you again soon.